Well, that was a, a fitting intro. I think it's the first time we've ever had a speaker come on to music at, uh, at Wide Days. And um, it's very fitting because these are actually the first words in your book. Um, it's from, um, now I've seen the sadness in the world. I'm sorry I didn't see it before. And it's from Mother, I've taken LSD by the Flaming Lips. Simon Williams, welcome to Wide Days. Thank you very much. And uh, this is a, it's a copy of the book, For Sale Outside. Um, there's a big pile of them. Uh, most of you were too busy while um, Simon was waiting patiently for people to come and buy them so he could sign them. So afterwards, he's going to go back and go and pick up a copy. It's not that easy to get everywhere. I had to look in a few places. Then I left my first copy in Sweden. I had to buy another one. <laughs> so, anyone wants to buy a copy of me, uh, if they're sold out, come and say hello. But I think that, um, let's, let's start with why you selected that to begin your book. Um, I think uh, in the midst of COVID, it got very confusing for everyone, especially me. And then, um, and I heard a new Flaming Lips track on Six Music, and then they started popping up videos. And then the American Head album came out. And it was kind of, oh, this is really good. And but the most annoying thing was, it was kind of like, it was like proper psychedelic, melodic, crazy rock with like sad elements. And I thought, the last time I heard this was the Soft Bulletin in like 1998. And I thought, have I just missed out on years and years worth of amazing Flaming Lips records? And I hadn't at all, because all the comments underneath just went, this is the best stuff since Soft Bulletin. Basically, everything else in between had been absolute bollocks. So I was really pleased about that. But it really, it just kept me going. I even got to the point of, you know, doing like weird shopping online during COVID. Like I got a new order technique t-shirt because all the money went to roadies who couldn't roadie for them anymore. And I got the Flaming Lips bundle from, uh, and I had to get it from America because Bella Union didn't do it over here. And there's at least three different packages still sitting in some FedEx shop in fucking Stansted Airport because they can never make it through customs, mainly because it's called American Head and it looks like it's made by a bunch of psychedelic freaked out fucking frazzlers. <laughs> so... We're going to get rewind pre-pandemic, very much pre-pandemic. Yeah. You're known initially as an NME journalist, uh, wrote for NME for a long time, um, for, for the Fierce Panda label, for Club Fandango, various, uh, various festivals. Um, so, I mean, really, uh, I guess this whole idea of the 360 model um, of the music business, you embodied it before that term had even been coined. And, you know, where did it start? I mean, your, was it, where, what was your first real musical memory? When did you start to get obsessed? I think for me, the, the, main, the main thing's always been the gigs. So I kind of, um, you know, you go through the, you go through the wombles, then Jilted John, then ELO, and then the Anti-Nowhere League, then the Jam, then New Order, and then the Farmers Boys. 1981, Lyceum, Farmers Boys, the Higsons, loads of bands from Norwich, and that just changed everything. I thought, this is, this is the most exciting thing I've ever been to in my entire life. And I was 16 years old, and that's the same principle that still sticks with me to this day. It's the gig is the thing. Without that, there's, you know, that's why COVID was so extraordinarily weird for everyone. It wasn't just me not being able to go to gigs. It was the fact that for the entire music industry, it was like, that's, this is weird, isn't it? There are no gigs. And then, you know, I think what we're seeing now is that the relief, like people thinking this is, we're all back and we're slightly drunker than before, which means that we don't feel the pain of the fact that pints of lager are now seven pounds in London, that kind of thing. You kind of, you don't notice it so much. But yeah, definitely, the, yeah, the live show was, it, I, I was, I was, I was, I was mesmerized. And I mean, how did you, at what point did you decide you could actually work in music or in, I guess, writing? Because initially you started with a fanzine, didn't you? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure if that ever, that moment's ever arrived, to be honest with you. I mean, back then there were no courses. If you wanted to do, say, I quite like the music press, so I'll be a journalist. And then back then you had like three colleges, I think, Preston, Harlow and Doncaster, I think. 
and they were, and then obviously you do a course there, and then you join a local paper. Um, and I applied for Harlow because that was the nearest one to me in London, and uh, I got rejected. I failed the interview um, to become a journalist, and then I joined the NME and worked there for 11 years instead. So I don't know what, I don't know what that says about Harlow College or or the NME, but it's there was nothing else there. Whereas now. You know, I I frequently get CVs from people who are are just much better qualified to do my job than I am because they've got this and that, all the degrees and courses behind them Um, and like legal knowledge and business knowledge and marketing knowledge. And and it's like, I can't employ you because then I'd have to sack myself. (laughs) Um, Did you... Did you start the fanzine? Is you know what gave you that that idea? What you know what made you do it? Um, well, what I worked out is the recurring theme in the book is I've never had an original idea in my entire life. So I started the fanzine because everyone else was doing a fanzine, and it looked like I remember. I think I, I was at watching the House Martins at Hammersmith Clarendon. And the legend was there selling his fanzine. And I thought, that looks tremendously exciting. And you had Are You Scared to Get Happy, um, who then became Sarah Records. Obviously, the legend then went on to be, you know, do his stuff at Melody Maker, as ever it true. Um, When I was selling my fanzine, I used to go to this place called The Panic Station at Dingwalls in Camden. And every Monday night was free. And you'd see Primal Scream, The Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, all that, sort of 1988, 89. And, um, and the weird thing was that one week, the sales would be brilliant. So you'd go along and you could sell a few copies. And then you'd get like a, sell a few copies, get a pint of beer, and then maybe even, maybe even a kebab on the way home. If you'd had a really good night, you could actually eat food. And then the next week would be terrible. And I couldn't work it out. And then you realize that someone else had got there before me. There was another fanzine, and it turned out to be Going Deaf for a Living by this little fellow called Steve Lamack. So he was basically stealing my crowd. What I didn't realize was that he was going through exactly the same thing, but without the kebabs, obviously, which is in the sense that he'd turn up as like some bastards robbing me of my audience. And we became friends because of that. And then he, he, he was at the enemy about six months before I was, and, um, and he basically got me in there. And, I mean, who, what kind of artists were you covering in those days? Can you remember the first interview that you did? Oh, yeah. Um, I went to see the Ice Core Works at um, the Electric Ballroom, and I didn't, I didn't know about, like, PR companies or anything, so we just, uh, me and my friend Marie just went to the sort of stage door after the set and got, we'd like, hello, we'd like to interview the band, and uh, got let backstage, and then ended up going to some hotel called the Columbia, and I was thinking, man, alive, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Apart from the fact that Columbia was like even further away from our house than we, you know, from, from there to Walthamstow. It was an absolute pain in the ass at three o'clock in the morning. But yeah, that kind of, that was really exciting. And I guess it was because they were like a, of a certain level back then, you know, so they were kind of, they were kind of very um, encouraging. And then around the same time thereafter, it was C86. <clears throat> so the Soup Dragons, the Bodines, you know, Close Lobsters, I did all those bands. And, uh, and, then, and then right towards the end, I mean, we basically just ripped off Melody Maker and ripped off everyone, ripped off Fizz, ripped off, you know, Are You Scared to Get Happy? We, we just stole everything from everyone. And then, uh, and then it was only right at the end where we started to, like, find our own bands and, and actually interview people that, you know, no one's ever heard of ever again. So for the, the younger viewers among you, C86 was a compilation that I think was probably the best thing that NME did in, the, in that era, which was a whole list of, um, well, just a huge compilation of indie bands, many of whom ended up becoming very successful and others just disappeared without a trace. But um, it is something that came as a, came as a cassette. And I've actually got it on CD, but I um, found it many years later. But it, is, uh, it, def- it was very era-defining, and this is really, the, I suppose, the, the foundation, you could say, of the, the indie things that, that followed, really. Yeah, and also the, 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 the culture there was so important. So with the fanzines, there was me, there was Stephen Matt, you had Stephen Wells, you had James Brown, basically none of us. You know, I, think, I think we'd all been turned down by Harlow College, basically. So we'd all had to do our own fanzines and make our own way. I think there were only 
probably Steve and Terry Staunton were the only trained journalists. The rest of us were just absolute morons who just done our own fanzine. And the whole point was we didn't do a fanzine to get into the NME. It was more like, you know, I saw it subsequently with, with other writers coming through when I, had, when I was the live editor. It's kind of like, you've done a fanzine. Okay, you're mad enough to do all this shit for absolute free, to go and see these bands and spend like a year of your life just committing nonsense to paper. You're perfect for this job. It was, just a, it was a really important thing. It wasn't a, it wasn't a career move. But, well, it was a career move, but it was an insane career move. And did you, I mean, did you get any guidance on your writing? Did anyone give you feedback? Um, well, the great thing about doing a fanzine is that it's kind of, okay, so I've, I've interviewed Mega City 4, literally the greatest band of all time, and it's kind of, it's just too long. I've kind of transcribed it, I've typed it out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the photocopier shop and I'm going to squeeze it down to 0.4 to make it all fit in. It didn't occur to me to cut it. it didn't, I didn't think, why don't we just get rid of like those 3,000 words where they just really go on. There's an <laughs> awful story about them falling out of a van in Norway. So with, when I joined the NME, when they just kind of, they, they just cut it like that. And they had a really, really big photocopier. They could have really, really <laughs> squeezed all the words down. They didn't. That was the most stunning thing. And they, they've got no time. They're, it's weekly. They've got no time. No time to go down to the photocopier shop, squeeze it all down, 10,000 words on Mega City 4. Yeah, that, that was the biggest shock. And, I mean, really, in those, those days of enemy, there's obviously, you paint a really good picture of it in the book, but... Do you think there, you know, in terms of the atmosphere, can you sum that up really uh, with, you know, for people who haven't read the book, what kind of environment it was you were working in? And, you know, really how the whole dynamic between the, the paper and the, the music industry and the, the readership was. I mean, it had a huge readership at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of, we, we weren't at the, the peak time. Um, and the good thing was that we always had, like, there was, you'd always find older enemy journalists in the pub. And they'd always go, oh, it's not as good as it used to be. Oh, the, uh, I mean, and the thing about the enemy was that in the early 80s, when it was all like Paul Morley and Charles Shaw Murray, I couldn't understand it. It was just no, so, it was it was so wordy and dark and... and unreadable. Un, it was unreadable. So I, I, I spent much more time reading Smash Hits and Melody Maker and, and uh, Record Mirror. Um, and then by the time I joined the enemy, we'd gone, we were, a little bit, we were a bit more accommodating, a bit more accessible. And certainly my role and Steve's role was kind of, we were given a Mega C4 Carter, Snuff, Ned Stomach Dustbin, bands like that. Like literally, we were literally writing for the kids rather than to impress anyone. We didn't need to use long words. We could use confusing words, but that's because we were just confused ourselves. And, and basically, we, that was our little, we just had a little like um, war zone in the office. That was our area. And, and every now and again, we'd pop up and I'd say to James Brown, or, oh, you know, I've just made Made of Stone single of the week by the Stone Roses. Maybe we should do a feature on them. And he'd go, Stone Roses, they'll never happen. And it was kind of like, oh, okay then. And then a year later, obviously, he's standing on top of a mountain wearing these enormous flares going that this baggy thing's absolutely brilliant. So we, and you, you get used to that. You know, you'd find the bands and then someone else would piss off to New York with them. And it was kind of, you know, but that just added to the moaniness down the pub. I remember like one time we were in, um, we were sitting in, the, sitting in the Stanford Arms in the afternoon. And uh, I think we just had... I think we just had, so Carter had been on the front, Ned Stomach Dust had been on the front, Sensor Season had been on the front, and it was like, this is the greatest moment. And even then, Steve was just still like, yeah, but, but Mega City 4 hadn't been on the front. You know, there was still, there was a rage there and a sense of injustice that kind of, that just kept us going. And also, I, I, I colleagues, David Quantic famously once said to me, he said, the reason why we like you and Steve is because you go to all the gigs so we don't have to. You know, there was, there was no, there's no dream there. There's nothing there. I think most of the guys, by the time they'd done the fanzine, they thought that they'd, they'd paid their, they'd done the hard dues. So they weren't out of the Bullen Gate every night, every week, because they just thought, you know, we can, we can now ponce around hanging out with Susie and the Banshees. And, I mean, what was the, then, what motivated you to go to all these places just, and hang just, out in all these rage, places? Rage, rage and lager, basically. That's the dream combination. 
That's the whole point. So he just rock up and go in a rage, yeah. get painted and watch bands. And uh, just watch bands, yeah. And, and back then you'd see, you know, there were, I don't know, at one, at one point we were trying to get, like, go to 250 gigs a year because what else are you going to do? You Did know? you actually set yourself that target? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And then we had terrible, 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 like, raging arguments about what, with a festival, how does that how does that count as a gig? Is like the entire Reading Festival one gig? Or is like each day, is that three gigs? Or what about each stage? Got very, it was lots of arguments going down the Bull and Gate. But it was just, it was just our, they were just our happy places. You know, as I said before, I think, you know, some people did the fanzine circuit and thought, they, oh, Christ, I'm out of that now. I can just like go on tour buses and stay in nice hotels. And others just carried on doing the same thing to their own detriment. <laughs> I mean, I've often been struck with, you know, the way that, you know, back in those days, I mean, now most stuff that writ is written tends to be very positive because most, uh, most so-called mu music publications with a, you know, few exceptions tend to just write about stuff they've been paid to write about um, in, you know, either directly or indirectly, usually so-called media partnerships. And, so, you know, it's rare to see someone just scathingly demolishing something. But um, I think that there were, that seemed to be a, a real thing in the, you know, in that kind of music press um, in, you know, in that era. And you often got the impression that, I mean, one of my mates wrote something that is someone had stolen his mobile phone and phoned Jamaica and run up a huge mobile bill. So he incorporated this into the review that, you know, he's, I'm in a bad mood, so I'm going to slag this band off, you know. <laughs> and if you think about it, that's pretty brutal. As someone, obviously the poor band that was uh, the, the victor, you know, that ended up indirectly being the victim of this theft, you know. I mean, did you, in those early days, did you just feel, all right, well, I'm in this mood, I'm just going to... I'm going to rip this apart, or uh, um, we're, what went through your head? We, we, we're talking about late 80s, it's very, very, very indie versus majors. So if you did the singles, for example, which is a, a, a great treat, and you'd go and you'd stagger home back to Walthamstow with this enormous IPC carrier bag full of 12 inches and CDs, and well, probably just 12 inches back then, and then um, and you would tend to, you couldn't enthuse about everything because you'd go completely insane. So what tended to happen was that you'd bung in a couple of major label releases. So in the middle of like all the stuff that came out on Creation and Factory and Decoy Records, you'd maybe give something a bit of a kicking on Warners. And I mean, so, I mean, I just remember I gave Head On by the Mary Chain an absolute kicking, which is it's literally one of the greatest songs of all time. But just because by then they were on a major label, so I thought, fuck it. Not deliberately just to fuck off major label. Sometimes we made major label bands singles of the week. It was fine. But there was an element of, you know, you need that balance. You can't be nice about everyone. But, yeah, I mean, we, 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 were, I mean, yeah, we were far too... Yeah, I mean, I kind of... I don't know. I had a, I had a, I had a, we had really, really bad run-ins in, run with uh, Manic Street Preachers because we thought they were just fucking awful. You know, a it's lot of people now, did. That was, you know, it's an interesting one because uh, I don't know people that, you know, rave about the Manic Street Preachers in, in the early, even in those early days. And I can remember them playing in Edinburgh and one of my mates worked in the bar, um, the, you know, just down the road. They all came in after their show wearing the lanyards. And Edinburgh being Edinburgh, everyone just thought they were wankers. Yeah, it's like, yeah, so what? You've just done the show. Uh, we don't care, you know. The, 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 the luckiest thing is, I remember, uh, it's the last time I mentioned Mega City 4, but they were really important to us because they were very punk rock, very, very indie, very, came very much through John Peel um, and the punk rock scene at that time. Fraggle Rock, we called it, obviously. Um, and... I remember reviewing them and the Manics together, and it was the New Art Riot EP that came out of Damaged Goods. And I remember saying, one of these bands is getting a major label deal, and it's not Mega City 4. It's a disgusting, disgraced music industry. It's gone, it's gone to shit, that kind of thing. Inevitably, I think, I think, I think the Manics won, really, didn't they? But, but the interesting thing was that the, that single came out of Damaged Goods Records, and two years later... I set up Fierce Panda with him, with Ian, who ran that label. And there's always been that little bit of thing with him thinking I'm an absolute wanker because I gave his record an absolute kicking. But God bless him. He, you know, if it had been me, 
the other way around, I'd have just told him to piss off. But he was, he was so sweet about it. And he hated the enemy anyway, so it wasn't that much of a problem. And he's still repressing that EP on various colours for the Japanese market. They, they really like Manic Street Preachers. I mean, I, I, I think that there's, you know, one of, this is a nice setup for something that you recall about the pastels. And I think that we, we had a chat before where I was like, can you read this? And he's like, no, you read it. I want to hear it in your voice. So what we've agreed is the next thing that Simon read, uh, the next thing to be read, I'll get Simon to read. But I, I, this really tickled me. Um, the pastels, obviously, for those, uh, the younger viewers, uh, as seminal Scottish indie band uh, fronted by Stephen Pastel, who uh, owns Mono uh, or Monorail in Glasgow, and um, this is this is a little bit that I, I wanted to read out because it really tickled me. Um, in the post, as well as things like records and fanzines and T-shirts, us showbiz journals would frequently be sent letters. One day I got a letter written in very lurid green ink that turned out to be a very furious bespoke poem from pastel singer Stephen Pastel, in which he concluded that I was a dumb cunt. This followed a series of unfortunate events whereby I'd reviewed one of their singles in a slightly unflattering manner and followed that up by not being entirely flattering about their album. By the time Helen asked me to go and review the Pastels live show at Yulu, I realized we were entering dangerously lurid green ink territory, and I explained that after the single and album reviews, a live, a live kicking really wouldn't be a hat trick to cherish for either me or the band. But Helen was so desperate to find someone to do the gig, perhaps the fact that nobody else wanted to touch their Yulu show with a barge pole that night, was a bit of a giveaway that she pleaded with me to go to appease the band's press officer. And so I relented and I went and I duly slagged off the live show to complete the set and presumably pissed off that very same press officer, not out of spite or malice or any malevolent, malevolent attempt to sabotage the pastel's career, but because I was naive and honest, and I just thought they were quite a bit shonky, even for a shabby indie kid like me. So, I mean, have you ever spoken to Stephen Pastel since then? No, no, I, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't think it's the kind of thing he's going to get over it. But... Do but you the weird thing was, that again, do they again with context, is one of my best friends is, is such a massive Pastels fan that he's literally, when they played the garage, he's got ticket number 001. There was no 002 for him because he just went on his own. That's how. <laughs> and, and I kind of, sometimes we talk about it, but no, it's awful. I kind of, I felt so bad and it wasn't right. And, 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 and the fact follows, it was a chance to apologise to Stephen Pastel, even though, I mean, that's fucking awful, aren't they? I mean, just, God. I mean, I really love me indie. And he, the status is brilliant. It's, but, you know. But, do, yeah. do you, I mean, do you think that Monorail ever stocked Fierce Panda records? The mind, I mean, I don't know. I, I just remember, the other interesting thing is that we used to get absolute dog's abuse from certain quarters because we started Fierce Panda in the corner of the enemy office. So it looked a bit weird, even though, you know... It, it, but at the same time, there were about six labels being run out of the enemy office because everyone thought, this is very exciting. We really like new bands. This is absolutely marvellous. So, you know, you, you kind of end up with these kind of situations of compromise. And it turned out there was a shop in, I think a shop in Bath, which might have had something to do with flying saucer attack. And apparently they had a, just a very special, slightly unflattering section for records by music journalists. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> just wankers. <laughs> so, yeah, working on that basis. And I, you know, I, I was nice about Flying Saucer Attack. So, yes, yeah, so the mind boggles with, as with Steve. And, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's fine. Did you, you ever know? actually get... I did, make up, I did make up with James Dean Bradfield, though. So that was okay. Did well, you ever get physically White, attacked? Wanker, so. Or <laughs> was there any incidents where it got extremely uncomfortable or where you had to just hide... Oh, some people, Martin Rossiter said, I'm going to punch you because I'd only given his soppy album seven out of ten. You know, it's kind of just, I'll piss off. <laughs> you know, and that was a divine comedy gig. It's, come on, have some context here. It's not like, you know, that was annoying. And then maybe, there's maybe a couple, but overall, you know. And the other thing was that because cause we absolutely loved gigs, 
we were out and about all the time. We were literally... There was, no, there was no hiding on the 25th floor. Whatever we wrote about, it's kind of, well, it, it, we're out and about. You can find us. You can find us at lunchtime. We'll be in the pub at lunchtime, you know, just shooting the breeze and just moaning about whatever else we needed to moan about. So PR people could find us at lunchtime. It, nighttime, we'd be at the Dublin Castle. We were very, very, very boring people. We'd be at the Dublin Castle, the Bull and Gate. Bands could find us. You know, we're the most, we're the, 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 the shittest spies of all time. It was just can be complete overload and, and just general. We're just like just getting a bit pissed, really. And, and did you? I mean, in those days, did you find the the PRs and the record companies would really lavish you with um, with hospitality, let's say, or dare I say, even bribes? Uh, not really. No, sadly, no. I mean, it was. I mean, I mean, it was just. If you, if you spent three years doing a fanzine and then all of a sudden you're on this mailing list and, and every day it's the records and the T-shirts. The one thing that annoyed me was the fact there were never any pants. No one made <laughs> pants. But, you know, the 100 Reasons jacket, the fun-loving criminals jacket. I'm still using my XL records bag to this day, you know, 20 years after going on the road with the Prodigy in North America. All those kind of, you know, you, 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 and the, it's just free, free gigs. I get in for free? And then, and you know, and I, but the, the problem was that, and also in the early days, it wasn't just Indie Smindy, you'd be sent out to do like really weird jobs like Joan Armour trading at Hammersmith Odeon, that kind of thing, and Testament at the Astoria. It's basically, again, Helen pan panicking and just going, shit, I've got the PR on the phone. And, and, and obviously, Joan Armour trading is not very indie, and Testament aren't very indie, but it was kind of nice as well, because again, you can't. You know, you can't spend your entire time watching new bands because you would go completely insane. It's interesting because something that dawned on me um, just a few years ago was that music journalists are never, you know, even now those that are lucky to get enough to get some kind of payment, it's really crap. Um, and I think that even in your era, the the pay, pay for music journalists was really low and you see where a lot of them ended up on national newspapers and doing other things because it was obviously much better paid but how much of a difference did getting all those free records make to your monthly income i mean i, I remember one assistant editor of a nationwide magazine where i did my work experience uh keeping the music editor title when she became the editor because she was she was getting 800 quid a month in selling our um selling all the stuff that she was sent uh, yeah we had um yeah our man <laughs> our was man, it mr our man. cd so we had to, we had manchester joe right. and he'd, he'd drive down and, and uh, you know i on the money front it wasn't that bad it, it was it was tough being a freelancer and and the problem is that you know the knock-on effect is that you're you can't be ill because if you're ill you can't work and you don't get paid there's no such thing as sick pay for freelance journalists it's fine when you're you know so i was freelance for about two two three years and then steve sutherland turned up and from melody maker and then half the staff walked out and then i became live editor and then and, and on, ed, on editor at the same time for new bands. And then I had a salary. But even as, as freelancer, it's fine, you know, as I say, as long as you don't get conjunctivitis or anything like that, or you lose your ears. But it's, you know, because you're part of IPC, it was, a, it was a proper grown up. You've got, you know, you get into the lift and there's someone from Melody Maker on the floor above. And then there's, there's a lady with a whip because she works at Horse and Hounds. And then there's, <laughs> there's someone from Woman's Weekly. You know, well, the, NM, the NME wasn't keeping the lights on at IPC. They had, like, much, much bigger publishing fish to fry. But you're, you all get paid equally, you know, and it, it wasn't that bad. Obviously, so, but it, I understand now, but it is absolutely hopeless now. How yeah. much more money did you get through selling your CBTs to <sighs> Manchester, I Joe? I can't really remember. Um, I know that the, 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 the albums editor would regularly pocket 400 quid a month. Right. Um, and he'd and still be going, he wasn't selling everything, he'd still be going home st with stuff that he liked. And there was a lot of stuff to be liked in, you know, 1996 or whatever. Um, but then there was a lot of rubbish as well. But Manchester Joe, he was marvellous. And then you didn't, have to, you didn't have to do the old thing, going down record and tape and all that. 
Yeah, I remember a place called Mr. CD in Soho. Mm. And they would take everything, but they made you go through this ritual humiliation. And the guy would just be like making this pile on you, you know, and you'd be like, shit, shit, you know, you know, and it's like, a, and he'd make this huge pile of stuff that was, he reckoned you, you know, he's doing you a massive favor, just removing it from you. And then he'd make a sort of smaller pile that was all right. And then there's obviously the smallest one was the stuff he approved of that might have some commercial value. And then, um, at the end of it, I mean, we took in an Ikea bag when my magazine was about to close down, and um, it was really the total dross, because my editor had basically been, um, he'd taken the first bag, and I'd, I'd mixed it all up. He took all the good stuff, the bastard. And um, so me and my colleague had to go through this humiliation. And then he was just like, best I can do is 350 quid. <laughs> Michelle and I just kind of stayed poker faced and we're like, yeah, okay then, you know, and the outside like fucking hell, you know. Uh, but I mean, that is an interesting thing because I think now it is that element that for, you know, someone who is on those, you know, what is a mailing list now, you know, you get sent a link and it is a massive hole in the, in the income of anyone that's still writing or covering music. Yeah, yeah, we I mean, were, I think, I think, well, I mean, again, I don't want to sound like an old enemy journalist going, oh, it was much better in my day. But it really, really was much better in my day. And we were, we were the last of, you know, at the time of, like, Britpop Oasis, you just stuck them on the front and you do 150,000 copies of uh, a week um, until you do them too many times. And then it kind of... I left in 1999, by which point it was already starting to crumble. You could just... Melody Jamaica was... Record Mirror had gone, Sounds had gone, Melody Jamaica had about a year more to go. And then once Melody Jamaica went, that killed the enemy. I think they had the last flourish, didn't they, with um, Strokes, White Stripes, the whole New York thing. And then the Libertines kept them going for a bit longer. But it was just... It was just horrible to read. But on the PR front, it was like, you know, again, what we loved doing was we loved writing about bands who didn't have PRs. We were there so early that... You know, we weren't, you know, being, you know, stuff wasn't being forced on, well, it was, stuff was being forced on us all the time. But most of the time it was brilliant. You know, you're talking to, you know, the people who come to the pub with this would be from Creation or Factory or labels like that. And they'd be going like, here's the new order single, here's the, would you like a pint of lager? And you're going, that's not a bad world, is it? You know, what's, who, who we got next? It's kind of, you know, so-and-so from Emma from Creation is coming in with this new band called Ride. And you're going, and then, and then what are you doing tomorrow? I've got some band called Radiohead. I've got to do an interview with them for the on piece. That, you know, it was, it was, it was just, just, that was absolutely the norm. And then, you, you know, being there early is obviously what characterizes um, Fierce Panda. And what point did you decide to set that up and, you know, just summarize how it, it took off? I think. Just, just around about, so to about the early 90s, people started understanding the branding concepts with the enemy. No, and it wasn't even so much IPC itself, it was just more other people. So we, we started like doing this club smashed thing at the powerhouse. And, um, and it was Neil Pengelly from Reading Festival. And he said, what I'm going to do is it's going to be every Wednesday. I'm going to choose the bands, but it's going to be tied in with the enemy. You and Steve are going to be DJing. We'll pay you money. And the first night we'll have Suede and Pulp will play the Christmas party and Radiohead will play. And, and then tons and tons of other bands that never got anywhere. Um, we had people like trying to do TV programs with us. XFM set up and they wanted us to DJ. It was basically this kind of you were associated with the enemy and then people thought you were talented, which is very dangerous because we were just a load of dweeby journalists that had absolutely no other talents whatsoever apart from going to gigs and getting drunk. And then, and then we invented this thing called New Wave of New Wave, um, which was based around six bands. Actually, it was based around two bands, Smash and These Animal Men. And, um, and as John Harris famously once said, it was like Britpop without the tunes. But it was basically, without that, it was basically amphetamines, Adidas, all the other A's. And then within six months, Britpop had arrived. And they'd filched the entire style. But just, you know, some of the bands had just added a few more melodies. Um, anyway, so we decided in a pub one night that we should do a tribute to this scene. We should release a record. 
and we thought we'll do like an EP with some of our favourite bands. And then we thought, and now we need, okay, now we need to think of a name for the record company. So then we came up with Fierce Panda because we thought we're only ever going to release this single and that'll be it. It's not like in like three decades time we'll be having to explain why it's called Fierce Panda Records. Uh, get the book, then you'll find out why it's yeah. called Fierce Panda Records. Um, and you very, I mean, you soon carved out a reputation for being, you know, first there, much like you, you were saying about with the NME. And Coldplay, I guess, is the one that, um, the biggest out, out of them all. And I think it's interesting because I remember the first time I'd heard about you and people were like, yeah, they're the there's the label they always put out the first record by a band but the implication was you didn't aspire to um do anything more that was your ethos just to put out one are record we, are we heading towards the best joke in the book no okay uh, well um, no we are i think you'll find <laughs> the only joke in the book so when i grew up um i grew up in walthamstow and there was a shop there called small wonder records and they had a label um and they did bauhaus and the cure um, who then moved on to bigger labels. And then throughout the 80s, every single, virtually every single band that I liked went from an indie to a major, whether it was the Farmer's Boys, whether it was the House of Love, whether it was, I think I could just, I could just carry on, REM, Green Day, etc., etc. I'm trying to think of maybe, maybe New Order and Depeche Mode were probably the only two bands, significant bands I can think of who stuck with their indie labels over here, but I think both had money from American deals. Um, so when it came to setting up Fierce Panda, I thought that's just what happened. You know, indie labels, they just do the first couple of singles and then the major labels come calling. So it was completely normal behavior. And of course, you know, I think at one point we counted up that 72 bands had left Fierce Panda for bigger labels. And that's from Coldplay, signed to Parlophone, to the computer signed to One Little Indian. And, um, and it was kind of, you know, we, we, try, we did try and move on, but by this point we'd made a rod for our own back. Or, in the case of Chandelier by Idlewild, we'd made a rod, a Roddy, a Colin, <laughs> and a Mad Bob for our own back. That's the big joke in the book. And fuck, no, you don't need to buy it. <laughs> well, there are rods in the audience know, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and... I mean, how did that feel? Because I think there is that element that obviously you're busting a gut, you're really putting in all this energy and you know emotional energy, passion into these artists, and you are developing the the label. So it it's it goes beyond being a, a hobby label. You're employing people. I mean, there's there's two former employees at least in the audience here, and um, it. It really, how does it feel? I mean, how did you, do you have that thing where on the one, on a good day, you're like, oh, well, fair enough, I'd have done the same. And you're, on a bad day, you're like, what a bunch of wankers. Yeah. No, no. I mean, as I said, it was kind of, it was, we, we'd set it all up and the whole point was to help the bands. The whole point was, and it wasn't even back then. I was on XFM, I was putting on gigs at Dublin Castle, I was writing for the NME and I was running a label. So it just crossed all the barriers. So even now, doing the, you know, with Coldplay, they don't remember us for the single, they remember us for T and being, being, them being one of the new tips for 1999. They felt that that was the thing that gave them that impetus and that confidence to move on. Because by then, you know, every major label had seen them and turned them down. Um, ditto with Idlewild. We were talking earlier on about, you know, the review says flight of stairs, falling down a flight of stairs. You know, that's, that's more remembered in many ways than Chandelier is, even though it's a terrific record, Rod. Um, so it, it was kind of... We were there kind of, and because of that, it meant that we worked with the bands really, really intensely for kind of six months, really. And then, so when they went, you know, the model's brilliant. I can see it now with Nice Swan Records or Speedy Wonderground. People are going, oh, those guys are so cool. And it's kind of, yeah, because they do the first single and then fuck off, just get the fuck out of there. And many a time, it was kind of like, no, no, please do leave us. Please do go to another label because we don't want you. And then when Coldplay went to Parlophone instead of staying with us through Mushroom, I thought, I'd have signed to Parlophone in 1999. There, you know, if you quite like Radiohead, that's where you'd go. So I couldn't really complain. I only really complained 
when we tried to sign Keane to Ireland and we got absolutely fucked over. But apart from that, apart from that, I've got absolutely no fury or bitterness about anything that's happened with Fierce Panda Bands. Yeah, that's, you give a different impression in the book. <laughs> and I am going to call you out on it because I think there's something in the book where you're like, yeah, I was really positive about this, but then I thought differently, you know. So I would encourage you to uh, read the book even if you don't, you know, you'd be very diplomatic here. But yeah. I think the reason I mention it is because I think there are, um, there are parts where what comes across is that actually is quite hurtful because, you know, or where you're written out of a, a documentary about um, Coldplay or, you know, other artists where you have actually been, you know, done a great job and you've really helped them and then they, they just disappear down the dumpster as soon as they do that big it, deal. Yeah. I, think it's, I think that's the, the nature of the indie beast, really. So with the Coldplay film, I kind of... I mean, I was, I was so looking forward to it. Like, this was going to be the definitive film about the band's entire career. And it started off... So we went to this lovely cinema, the Curzon Cinema, for the world premiere, um, right opposite the fire station on Shaftesbury Avenue. And, uh, and there were canapes and free drinks and the whole... The whole original team from 1999 was there, you know, Gavin the lawyer and Debs Wilde who discovered them and Caroline Ellery who had signed their publishing and, and I was in a terrific mood. And, um, and then the film started and it starts with this amazing kind of super, super duper mega gig in South America. I mean, the last time they were on tour, they kind of sold out 10 nights in Buenos Aires. You know, they've gone beyond the Dublin Castle. And then, but then it kind of flicked back to stuff even I'd never seen before, before we got involved from the Laurel Tree, when they were still called The Coldplay. So absolutely shonky, handheld. I mean, I don't even know what it was in 1998. I probably had a Blackberry if I was lucky, let alone, so it must have been a video camera. And then it kind of, and then it kind of, I was thinking, this is amazing, you know, lovely wine, absolutely marvellous. And then it kind of did this thing, and someone had said, I think it was, might have been Debs beforehand, I said, I presume I'm not in this film because no one's interviewed me. And she went, none of us are in the film. It's not that kind of film. It's an arty thing. And they basically let their mate just kind of do this massive arty thing. It's not going to be like the story of Coldplay. Except after 20 minutes, they do this thing. And then what happened was they played the Falcon. And Steve Lamax saw them, and he played them on Radio 1, and then they signed to Parlophone, and then they became enormous. And I thought, oh, have I just, have I missed something here? What about that, what about Brothers and Sisters and The Bull and Gate and Fierce Panda? So I walked out. I walked out of the Curzon Cinema. Um, I should have said I stormed out, but I didn't. I kind of went out hunched over so I didn't get in the way of it because it was halfway through the film. But I see it was the most painful, horrible... I just, what's, the, what's, the, what's the fucking point, you know? It was really insulting. But I guess the guy who's making the film, it's like, what's Fierce Panda? Who cares? Who knows, who knows what Fierce... Oh, what annoyed me was, what annoyed me was that people will watch that and they'll just think that's what happened. When, in fact, they, they need to know the perils and the fact that the band were completely rejected by everyone. The only reason why we did Coldplay was because no one else wanted to sign them. That's not A&R genius on my part. That's just kind of just being in the, in the wrong place at the right time. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I They're remember infuriating. doing a panel with a V2 A&R guy and he was saying that, you know, he's having a clear out and then, you know, years later found this, this demo from Coldplay and he's like, oh, oh. <laughs> oops. <laughs> um, but it is, it's, it's interesting because I think that, you know, in a way there's almost like an element of... Um, masochism in this you know the uh, you know I, i've seen it a lot with managers as well particularly with managers but where it is almost that element of having this total passion for the music wanting to develop something wanting to create you know help an artist but then also feeling kind of upset when you're spat out afterwards or just not even acknowledged. I think the acknowledgement, there's another great thing about the book is that people like Debs Wild are actually credited for that because in that era there were a lot of people who did amazing things. I mean, a mate of mine signed the publishing for Sigur Ross, The Killers and Queens of the Stone Age but he's completely written out of that history and had to sign a non-disclosure agreement when he left, you know. The band that he was managing got, uh, he got them a 60 grand advance 
and they sacked him the week afterwards, you know, and it is, um, you know, it's, it's good to actually have that perspective, I would say, you know, but my question is really, how do you, how do you motivate yourself to carry on under those circumstances? What is it that makes you, makes you continue? Are we back to, are we back to raging lager? I mean, the, the thing is, I think the, the thing is I'd, be, I'd be going to gigs anyway. So that's, right. that's the point. My, my idea of like, um, if I'm in London, for example, and I haven't got a fierce panda band playing, um, so I've got a night off. So I think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a gig then. That's my idea of fun. Um, because you can always find, you know, it's not even for A&R purposes, because it's not, I don't really need that many more bands, and I don't go out there. I, don't, I only spent 15 years trying to sign the next Keen or Coldplay. And then, and then I had that situation with one of, with one of the bands where, you know, they, they sacked me off after we'd been managing them, and it was like, oh, that's really annoying. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, you'll find, I don't know, there's, there's just, there's so much great weirdness out there. That's, that's what I really like. And I'd still do my little monthly shows at Dreambags Jaguar Shoes. And if you do think to yourself, it's a bit stupid, isn't it? It's a little bit, you, aren't you too old for this? But part of me is I'm just very, as much as I like going to gigs, I'm very, very, very lazy. And I can't go to more than two gigs a week because I kinda, I'm just too old. And so with Jaguar Shoes, I can just put on three bands and it saves me from going to three different gigs, which was exactly the same philosophy we had when we set up Club Fandango. It's kind of, you know, Tuesday nights at the Dublin Castle. It's kind of, you know, why, why do I have to go and see four different gigs to see these? Why don't we just put all four bands on the same show? And let's see if we can make Tuesday sexy, because Tuesdays were never sexy, because no one used to go to gigs on Tuesdays, because the bands were terrible, because the promoters didn't give a shit, because the fact the punters didn't come, because the bands were terrible, because the promoters didn't give a shit, because the pun et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What about if we start putting on really interesting bands on Tuesday? And then for about six years, we ruled the world, because we put on the Killers, everything beginning with K, apart from Kasabian, uh, Arctic Monkeys, da, 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 all of the Dublin Castle. And I think that, you know, obviously we've talked about the more career elements, the, you know, how you've, the, what you did as a journalist, the label, Club Fandango, but I think it, it's really important to talk about, you know, essentially how the, the book begins, or, you know, there's a, there's a short chapter, and Page number seven, you start, you relate your, the, basically relate the final night of 2019 and the process you went to when you were going to commit suicide. And I think that this is something that is, um, it's really interesting juxtaposition. It's really like having two books, the, the side around what you, what you did with your work and your, the side of the music, and then the side is the, you know, your f failed suicide attempt. Ultimately, obviously, we're, that's why we're here now. You know, but how the, you know, how it sort of continues um, and your recovery, and it's it sounds really, it sounds when I describe it really heavy. But what I actually find was that. I really began to, obviously I knew you'd got through it, but I really wanted to read how you got through it and, and what that, that thought process was. Because I think that especially, you know, and I can really relate to this, the idea that if you're running something and everyone else is dependent on you and you're out and about and you're, you know, your entire existence is social, there is very often that thing that people just don't have a clue. And I think that, it is interesting to see what, you know, what kind of brought you to that point where you tried and, you know, how did you, how did you get onto that road to recovery, really? On the, what, the road, the road to nowhere or the road out of nowhere? I don't know. It's, 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 I was talking about it the other day with, I did a thing in Barry St. Edmunds in Suffolk and, and Seymour Quigley was doing the, he was doing the, he was master of ceremonies. And he was saying, he was saying, so then you had the breakdown. And I kind of, it's really weird with the whole mental health thing. I think I didn't, no, to me, a breakdown implies that you just shut down and you can't do anything. I was like a, I was a, I was a fully functioning manic depressive. 
And I, I just diagnosed myself with that about the middle of 2019. You know, record sales are falling off the, the streaming numbers. I think the worst thing was me and Chris from the label, we sat down and worked out how many streams equaled a pint of lager. And we worked out. <laughs> Anyone want to guess <laughs> how many pints? We're talking London prices, so give it six quid. How many streams is that? Oh, if only. It's, it's actually 8,000 streams equals a pint of lager. Um, so then, of course, we got another pint after that. And, that was, and, and, and I was just, you know, I was just meeting really, really nice people who had really good jobs, who didn't have those jobs anymore. I was seeing all the, all the decent A&R people from major labels being sacked off. Um, the whole machine of us delivering Idlewild or Coldplay to the major labels was just shot to bits. That, that went in 2008. Um, you know, Spotify were just generally horrible to deal with, like, don't talk to us. And, and you just thought, oh, this is a real pain in the ass, isn't it? And in the end, so, so it was, yeah, it was, very, it was a very, 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 very calculated decision. But I always got the impression if I had the breakdown, then I wouldn't have been able to go through with it. And, um, and there were still attempts, you know, kind of that last day, if I win the lottery, this will save me, that kind of thing. But in the end, I, you know, this is, this, this, I know it sounds absolutely pathetic, but... My thinking was, if I do this, then I basically felt as though no one cared. I felt no one's listening to me. I'd send out 30 emails to A&R people and I'd get one response and that was an out of office message. And I just thought, this is just horrible. This is really horrible. And I was trying to get jobs at Tesco's and stuff like that. I couldn't even manage to do that because I didn't have the right, my passport was out of date or something and they need so much. It's very difficult getting a job at Tesco's. And, um, and so it just, it just all added up, and then you just go, oh, fuck it, you know? And then I thought, if I do this, then people will care. And finally, Coldplay will do that really big benefit gig at Wembley, and all the money will go to my family to keep them going, because everyone will want to make sure they're fine. And it was like that. It was, it was just, you know, it was like basically arranging your own funeral without inviting anyone along. But there was the, that was the logic. The logic was, this will, my, my death will be the rebirth of Fierce Panda Records. I mean, one of the things that really struck me with that is that, on the surface, like you say, no one really noticed. And I think that's, that's the thing with mental health, that very often people think, oh, yeah, depression, that's about you can't get out of bed and you can't go out and do, do your work. And I think that is the case with some people, but it takes on a lot of different forms. And I think that was, for me personally, it was really relatable with what you're saying in the book. You know, that element of you go out, no one's, uh, no one's any the wiser. And um, I think that in that regard, uh, is there something now where you look back on it and you... you you could have done it differently or you'd have looked at it in a, another way or how would you have broken that thought process? Um, I don't think you can really. I think you, you know, obviously I regret everything I did and it was an absolute pain in the ass. but on the other hand, it's changed everything. It's kind of, you know, I wouldn't be here now if I hadn't gone through what I went through and I certainly wouldn't be on stage right now because I was, the, I was just a bloke in the shadows. You don't need to, not literally the shadows, I wasn't Hank Marvin, but you wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, you'd, no one knew, no one was supposed to know who I was. I remember like Alan McGee was more famous than most of the bands on Creation. And I thought, oh, that's terribly wrong. Ditto for Tony Wilson and Factory. And I thought, well, that's never going to happen to me. Um, but I think, you know, I didn't know what to expect when the book came out because I'd never done it before. And then... Within a month, I was at a Music Minds Matter launch at Abbey Road. And just people just talking about just being working in the music industry and there were psychiatrists and psychotherapists on stage. And, and I felt, oh, okay, so there is a whole... It's, it's changing now. But there was, nothing, there was nothing in place for me. There was no one... And even if there was, I don't know if I'd used it. You know, when you, I, 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 I'd, I'd done gigs with Calm before. Um, I know where the Samaritan's phone number is on the railway bridge at Stone Market Station. That's not a problem. You know, there wasn't for lack of access. It was just, oh, you know, what am I going to say? Oh, I can't. T I'm, too t I'm too tired. I'm too fucked off to phone up the Samaritans. That's basically it. And I know that now, subsequent to that, there are other mental health charities. So I think it's Shout, who um, Harry Kane endorses. I think he sponsored their sponsor, the Leighton Orient Home Kit. 
Um, and their thing is that you don't need to phone us because we know that's difficult because you're sad. So you can just text us, you know. So and, and even with the, the panelists at the Abbey Road thing, um, they were talking about how now when you sign to Virgin or EMI or whatever, then there'll be it's a very holistic approach. Here is the human resources person. Here is the psychotherapist. You know, if you've got anything to talk about, then please feel free to come and talk to us. But then one of them said she worked at Warner's. And, um, and then one of the artists came to her and said, look, I'd love to talk to you, but you've just given me £650,000. So I feel a bit awkward about now <laughs> sitting down with you saying I'm a bit fucked up. So, but she said, but would you talk to me if I didn't work, if I wasn't working at Warner's? He said, yes. It's not, that, it's not you that's the problem. It's the fact that it's who you work for. So, so all these nuances are coming through. And, and they said, you know, they freely admitted that maybe sort of 2015, 2016, these people, the charities would be going in, help musicians, people like that would be going into the major record companies. And the major, you know, saying there's a real issue here with mental health. And the major record companies go, yeah, but, but we're all mental. You know, we're all, we're all in the music, we're all arty, so we're all nuts. And it's kind of like, you know, up to a certain degree, you know, where you can understand you need, everyone's a little bit eccentric, everyone's a little bit, you know, artistic, but, but you're, missing, you're missing the point that why, you know, why are band members killing themselves? You know, what, what, isn't that concerning for you? It might, it might, you might sell more records, but if there's, there's, something, there's something not right here. There's, the support is completely in the wrong places. And, and, I, and, I, and I found it, and I found it comforting. And ditto for you know when I, I decided to do the book, and it started off with I don't know, my psychotherapist said, "Can you write some words about your dad?" And I know it's like you know my dad died when I was five. That's a classic thing. It's been within me for 50 years. Blah blah blah. Really okay, whatever. And it was it was and it was beautiful just to sit there and actually have time to remember the tiny, tiny, tiny memories I have of being four and a half years old with my dad. And that kind of just triggered it off. And I'd, had, and I had to, I'd kept the diary from the hospital because I thought it's just really important to remember this. So for whenever and ever and think, you stupid arsehole. And, and we're talking about, it's, it's the comedic value, isn't it? It's that kind of, you know, you're listening in, it's two o'clock in the morning and down a distant corridor, you can hear the sound of Fix You by Coldplay. And you go, oh, for fuck's sake. And then you're thinking, well, at least, at least no one here knows what I do for a living or, or are dying, as the case may be. And then the medical expert rocks up the phone and goes, oh, just to let you know, massive fan of Death Cab for Cutie. That transatlantic emails got me right through med, call, med school in Edinburgh. And it's like, oh, Christ. Can't, you, can, you can run, but you can't hide. Yeah. That's another moral of it as well. I mean, but, uh, but what I was going to say was with the books was there was... I thought, people said, are you sure you're going to put the hospital stuff in there? And I said, well, there's, other there's no point in doing the book. You can't fudge it. You've got to go straight in there. And we've done it in a way that, as you said, it's kind of, it's quite, it's quite gentle. It's, it's kind of graphically gentle. Um, but obviously, at the same time, there's a whole generation of writers sitting at home, pouring out their hearts. So Ian Winwood's book, for example, Bodies, is basically like mine. He even ends up in the same bloody hospital bed at the Royal Free. Um, his is just more Kerrang, it's more rock and roll. But, I you know, think, and well, it was just lovely, what... same, with, same with Abbey Road, just to know you weren't on your own. That was the most comforting thing. I think, though, that's what I, I really liked about it, because the writing style's different as well. So the, you know, the, the, the main narrative reminds me a bit of that Chance in a Million. I don't know if you remember this. It was like a program, comedy program on Channel 4 in the 80s, and... Right. He, the main character, he, the writing style was loads of puns. It's, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, I think I picked up on quite a few of them, but I was like, the whole time I was like, every sentence here is something that um, I'm sure there's a double meaning or there's a song reference in it. And then the hospital narrative and the, you know, post-hospital narrative is, it's a lot more concise, it's a lot more succinct, but also has some real moments in it, like the doctor that, you know, uh, was a death cab for cutie fan, like the ambulance guy <laughs> that checked you out in the meantime and had Googled you, and your wife's just going, for fuck's sake, you know? And, and I really like that, because I think it is it's incredibly relatable, but at the same time, it is also... Um, you know, it is. It make you want to read. You know, I kind of look forward to those bits because obviously, you know, we see what happened, and I think that, um, you know, I guess bringing that element to, you know, 
a conclusion. I mean, you you wrote that book. Um, it came out last year. How did you get better? Um, the escitalopram helps. So a little one of those a day, and I probably need. To, apparently, I need to do that for the rest of my life. Um, I think it's just a change, just a kind of. I don't really know. I don't want to make it. It's not like Last Chance Saloon. It's a second life. It's a rebirth. It kind of is, I suppose. Um, I've, you know, you appreciate stuff a lot more. The escitalopram has one really weird side effect, which means that one of anything isn't enough. And I didn't realize that until I was talking to one of my friends, and he goes, do you know it's the fact that it just sends you completely crazy? Like in the olden days, you could have a pint of lager and go home. And then now it's kind of like you have to have this one becomes four, and then once you're on the four pipe, then obviously then you start smoking. And then, and then you're in the smoking area just talking to complete, just scaring random people by talking absolute <laughs> bollocks. And I went, oh, yeah, they have noticed that. That's what I've been doing for the past year. Um, oh, so, really? I so just thought that, that was like being Scottish, yeah? Yeah. And also, and the other key thing is, um, you know, I've just stopped sending myself to shit gigs. I just kind of, that was the thing, right? That was my duty. And, and, and it happened in a weird way. So, um, um, so coming, coming out of COVID, I decided at the start of last year, I was going to go, I come up, my New Year's resolution was to go and see 365 bands in that year. I mean, now I'm talking about it. I'm thinking, that's just insane. Not, but not 365 gigs, because that's really insane. But 365 bands. And I'm counting the Corgis twice because they supported themselves at the 100 Club, but they played two completely different sets. Ditto for Ian McNabb in Stone Market. But it just meant that if I went to see 365 new bands, I would go completely insane. So my mate Nigel said, I really, can you get me tickets for um, James Blunt? And I went, OK, yeah, I know you really like James Blunt. That's fine. I know a man at Atlantic Records. So I got him the tickets, and I said, right, you need to know who your plus one is. And there was this little... You know when on email there is that pause... And he go, and he said, "Well, you are. You're my plus one." And it was like, "Okay, wait a minute. I'm doing this thing. Well, I'm going to see 365 bands this year." So, I've, yeah. So, and, my, and then my daughter wanted to go and see Amal and the Sniffers and Mother Mother and My Chemical Romance. And then that means that you enjoy the Shackwell Arms unsigned bands even more because you appreciate it a lot more because it's not eight pounds for a pint of lager, which is what it is at the O2. So, yeah, so that, that, I think that's one of, the, one of the main differences is, okay, what was really, really making me sad? And then this goes back to, you know, we, we, talk, to, we talk to sort of people with money because the majors don't care anymore. So we talked to Distiller, who was the Dyson Hoover man, and we talked to Red Bull. Um, and the, the idea was we plug into this. They've got the money, we've got the years, da 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 da, da. And in the end, they both said... We, we'd like to work with you, but more importantly, we want to be you. We want to be Fierce Panda. We want to find those bands, and we want to build them from the grassroots up. And you're walking around Dalston on a Tuesday night, and it's pissing down with rain, and you've seen one terrible band at the Seabright Arms, and you've seen another one at Jaguar Shoes, and now you're on the way to the Victoria, and you're waiting for the bus opposite Jaguar Shoes underneath the fucking metal bridge, and the only people you've spoken to all night are the bar staff. And you just think, this then, this is it, is it? This is the glamour and the fucking glory. Of course it's not. But it's still, you know, as long as the bands are quite good, it can be quite good fun. And that's, that's, still, that's still the thing for me, still the same time. It annoys me when bands get in touch and they send me a demo and they don't mention the gigs because they don't think it's important because A&R people apparently don't go to gigs anymore because they just sit in front of their computer screens looking at the algorithms. So what's next for Fierce Panda? Well, um, the book's obviously killed everything for us. So apart from this, so the book is, um, is coming, out, coming out in paperback uh, in the autumn. And we're talking to um, some film people about doing something for Netflix or one of those. And then, um, and then on the 20, 2402, 24, Fierce Panda turns 30 years old. So we're currently in talks with various old lags about coming along and doing a compilation album and birthday gigs and stuff like that. Um, so we're trying to, do, trying to do the big grown-up stuff while at the same time still 
going down Jaguar's shoes because if we stop if we stop our own supply line, then we're completely doomed. Is Jaguar's shoes on Kingsland Road? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, man, I used to live on the other side of that bridge. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I remember when it still had shoes. It did have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. and bags. Yes, <laughs> yes, bags as well. I went to a party there once when it still had shoes and bags, but they just cleared those out of the way. Uh, Simon, thanks very much. Unfortunately, we're going to have to boost because we have to be out of the building at uh, six o'clock. But I do think that what we should do is um, put you next door next to where there's a huge pile of books. Um, if anyone wants a book, just can you go there now and buy it really quickly? And then Simon can, uh, Simon can be in the foyer and can sign it for you as you're, um, as you're going out. How about that for a bit of planning? Uh? And uh, so you buy a book straight outside, and then as you go down to the foyer, Simon will be there and he'll, he'll sign it for you. But Simon Williams, it's been a pleasure. Thank you Thanks very much. Very much. Thank you.